whenever we find something, we, we tend to go all the way and then sometimes a bit too far, too far out, I think. Uh, because I, I do think there's some, um, some point in having people learn how to deal with setbacks, struggles, etc. Sure. Sure. Um, because you, you're going to, you're going to be confronted by them. And then it's very important that you know how you could do this. I'm delighted to be joined today by um, probably the most patient man in the world, um, <laughs> Mauro van der Looy, um, who, in fairness, has has suffered many postponement and cancellations of this podcast because it's been in the offing for several months. Um, but anyway, uh, Mauro, I'm uh, delighted to welcome you and profuse apologies for my uh, lack of schedule planning. Thank you. And um, as I say, patience is a virtue, right? So... Uh... <laughs> already already it is a virtue yeah so um i wonder if i could just start the ball rolling by uh just getting your your background and your story and um mm -hmm. the journey you've been on and then um i'll start we can start talking about this uh excellent piece this excellent piece that you've written the coach makes the difference mm -hmm. and uh, i would love to delve into a few bits and have a conversation if that's okay yeah that's okay great so my background um well, I think like most of uh, the young, at least boys, but now uh, for girls the same, I think, uh, like most of them, I wanted to become a professional football player. And uh, I got into an academy myself at the age of 12, 13. And then uh, I hit a wall, uh, not literally, but uh, yeah, more or less on the psychological side I, with the pressure. I, yeah, it was, it was too much for me to handle at the time. Um, I was all already very interested in how people uh, were doing, why they were doing the things they were doing. So I think that's one of the reasons that yeah got me into the psychology uh, department. So I went to study psychology, child psychology first in um, Utrecht in the, in the Netherlands, and then I went on. It's quite kind of a funny story. Um, I, I was I was quite a typical student, just just doing the things what need to be done. Um, not really looking ahead. And then one day um, someone told me, hey, what, what are you going to plan on, on do for your master's? Because I was already at the end of my bachelor. And then I said, I don't know. Let's just check. I, I, I typed in into Google uh, sports and psychology, the two things that I love. And um, <laughs> yeah, it, it happened. It turned out to be that uh, there was a master track in uh, Amsterdam, University of Amsterdam. For the third year and i enrolled myself into this this master and then we had to do internship we had to do a thesis and i got the opportunity to do this with the, the youth academy of psv eindhoven and uh, yeah it was a great time a lot lots of learning and uh yeah when, when i was speaking in 2013 i believe and back then yeah it was even more uh, how do you say skepticism of psychology and a lot of people saying well, I didn't have that back in my day, so who are you, you know? So that was, for me, very, very, uh, how do you say, um, mm, a challenge from which I learned so, so much because you really had to be at top of the game to be, yeah, be invited by people to talk about, uh, you know, individual de development, team development, etc. And luckily for me, there were also people very interested in this. And one of them gave me... Um, the chance to become a, yeah, a professional youth coach with the Peace Behind Oven Academy, which was kind of far, funny because I didn't have any coaching badges. I didn't have any coaching ex experience as a football uh, coach. So I was fresh. And uh, yeah, Bastian Rimas, he, he, he gave me the opportunity. So I'm still very thankful for him. So then I went on to be a coach for four years with PSV. Also did some work on the culture especially also with the parents. So we started to do YouTube clips instead of those nights for, for parents because, yeah, those nights were for everybody a pain in the ass in terms of getting it planning-wise uh, organized, etc. So we, we, we started with YouTube clips so that everybody could see what we were doing, what we were aiming for, and they could look at it in their own time and as many times as they would wish. And obviously that we were also running around the campus. So if they had any questions, then... Yeah, the door would be open. 
Um, then also some sessions with the coaches on the psychology, psychological part of the, of, yeah, you know, developing players. Uh, how do they learn? Uh, what environment do they need in order to, yeah, to you know, to uh, come to the best fruit, uh, fruition that they can be? Then I, I went to Willem II um, in Tilburg, also in the Netherlands. Uh, Frankie de Jong, Virgil van Dijk came from that academy, and. Yeah, that was that was that was really cool because I was ten times uh, a week on the pitch from the youngest uh, squads to the to the elder squads. Uh, so I learned so many things, and there were so many good coaches uh, around there. Uh, Javier Abanal was uh, from Spain. He he came he came in. Bastian again was my uh, was my uh, boss over there, and. Uh, um, yeah, I, I got to do so many things there. Besides the training aspect and the, the coaching aspect, I was also into the culture with all the people involved within the club at the youth academy. How are we going to create a culture in which it's it's all about development of the of the players and of the teams and of the staff e even? So I, I, I was giving um, sessions on sleep, on food, on the mental side of the game with with teams throughout the ages. Um, and I was also responsible for the talent recognition, so the scouting part of the of the academy. So from um, the ages of 11 until 16, it was my cup of tea. And we had restrained ourselves because we, we strongly believe in uh, the growth mindset so that you are able to develop yourself. And yeah, it's quite hard to foretell where people are going uh, with their... Um, qualities etc so yeah we, we we didn't want to foretell but we did believe that if we have the players we put them in the right environment and if they're very motivated and committed to developing themselves then we believe great things can be done so we had ourselves uh, constrained with people or younger players only from tilburg the city and a couple of villages around this so we got rid of the um uh, the birth month, uh, the relative age effect, I should say, because we we made a formula of how to have uh, coaches and scouts look towards players. Um, now that is a, an end to itself, but it was quite yeah, it was quite interesting that you saw our teams being quite um, stable uh, in terms of this, instead of very unstable with only players born in January, because the cutoff date in in the Netherlands is January, and. Um, yeah, that, that's that's that that was quite a while, uh, quite quite a lot of things, very interesting things as well to do, and then there came a, a point that I thought, yeah, well, there's I I don't see any way to improve myself here, or there's no how do you say path for me to to grow into, and the club was very honest with, with me as well because I I would have wanted to be the become the the coach that could help players from the youth academy towards the first team. Uh, but yeah, the club didn't uh, didn't see that to be working, and then I switched to uh, Fontes University of Applied Sciences, and I became a teacher in psychology. And throughout those years in in in, in, in uh, being a football coach, um, yeah, what I really loved about being a, a a young kid on the pitch, and it's always dangerous to say things like this, I know, but what I really loved was the fun that I had on the pitch and the, the things I learned on the pitch, which I could use on the pitch, but also outside of the pitch, like receiving feedback, giving feedback, setting goals for yourself, dealing with struggles, etc. cetera. Um, and that's what I wish for every, yeah, for every kid, uh, ideally. And uh, I saw that a lot of coaches were struggling with, uh, yeah, with how they could do this. Um, and then, a lot of clubs asked me to go there for uh, sessions, and that's one night. And then a lot of people came would come up to me after the, uh, such a session, and they would say, "Oh, it's very, very inspiring. I'm very enthusiastic right now, and I got some uh, great tools to to go out there and to 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 apply in my training sessions or my my coaching around games." But yeah, probably uh, you also know that that's not a very sustainable way to develop coaches. So I thought to myself, if I really want players to develop to their fullest have the most fun time they could possibly have then the trainer the coach is very important and maybe a more sustainable way is to write a book about it i love to uh, to read so yeah then that idea was born and um, first it came out in the netherlands in dutch so that's three years ago from now and uh, since one year a little bit more i've been busy 
getting it out in the, in English. So that's quite a quite a big story already. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah. There's a long. That's a, that's a good story actually, and and really interesting. Um, lots of elements in in there. Um, one thing I just wanted to sort of like reflect on a little bit was, um, you your experiences of, um, you know, a culture where the coaches are very skeptical of psychology. I think that's in some quarters that's still probably the case. Mm -hmm. Um, but I know things have moved on quite considerably. But it's interesting, like how. My experience, I think, from you know, from from the way where I've looked, from the way you've attacked, you know attacked the book, is very much to sort of fill the gap. I think where very little coach education centres on mm -hmm. what you could call the software. I would I would argue it's actually the hardware, but you know, so very little coach education spends time talking about what drives the individual from a motivational perspective from a learning yeah. environment perspective from a developmental experience it's very much focused on the technical and the tactical and the physiological mm -hmm. and so you have very much centered in that space and it's interesting though how even now there's still not very much coach education focused on those areas i know it's improved but it's still not a lot and still, I think there's a degree of skepticism. Generally speaking, the default in coaches. Come on, from the internet, I looked your fast. And I think oh, I, I'm sorry. Froze. Ah, right. Um, <laughs> we're back. Um, so, so generally, the default in coaches tends to be: if there's a problem, there's either a technical or a tactical solution to it. Rarely is it that we look for the psychological or the mental emotional solution. Mm -hmm. in consort or separately so is that was that a big driver for your motivation to actually sort of put some information out there into coaching space that's very focused on the psychological emotional mental element mm -hmm. yeah it was and it's yeah I, obviously because i study psychology i'm i was quite a bit biased uh, mm -hmm. but it's really funny that you say uh, it's it's a lot about the, te the, uh, the technical the tactical physical um because um Almost every time when I go out to clubs and we do a session, then people come up to me afterwards and they say to me, I wish I got this during the coaching ba badges, edu coaching education, because I didn't receive anything on this. Um, so it's, and I, 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 I can understand because, well, the game it's it's quite difficult, etc. And yeah, if, if you know how to give a training session and you have the, the content, etc., it's very helpful. But uh, what I found out in my own experience, and then with reading books uh, and biographies of the biggest uh, coaches, at least, so Alex Ferguson, uh, Louis Vergaal, uh, Beb Guardiola, uh, Jurgen Klopp, and now I, I, that's why I love podcasts as well. It's because you get into the heads of the people that you normally wouldn't get. Yeah, you, you couldn't hear the, th the, the thoughts, etc. But in my experience, so I, when I began, at BSV, there were so many good coaches out there, so many coaches with a lot of experience. Uh, and even they, they, they had been playing on the highest levels. So they had, uh, I don't know how many caps for the Dutch team or how many professional games they played. Uh, but the funny thing what happened is that they were the better the better coaches, or at least they know more of the game than, than me at the moment. But then a lot of people in the club, they would come up to me during the season, during the seasons, and they would tell me, Mauro, your playings are really developing really, very, very good. And the way you play with the, the boys, it's it's exactly the, what we want. And so then I, it, it got me thinking into how is that possible? Because I am I don't have the, the, the most knowledge in, in the tactical side, the technical side. I was doing my badges, etc. And I was thinking about it with with the coaches and I was, you know, talking with, uh, with them and exchanging ideas. So I, I was developing myself in that. But I was nowhere near the, the the level of other coaches out there, but my players, they were developing at such a high rate that the people would come up to me. Um, so it got me thinking, and, and then I thought, how is this possible? And then it it kind of struck me that it. I think it's what's what's most important, and it's it's um, it's what a Dutch coach, uh, professional coach, um, he has his own podcast, and he says the same thing. He says. The way you treat people is ten times more important than whatever tactic you're using, etc. And the likes of uh, Guardiola, Klopp, 
also say this in their biographies that uh, that I read. Louis Vergal is famous, obviously, for his uh, total human principle. So he says, behind every player, there's a person and you need to get to know the, the person, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it was my own experience, together with what I read about the big coaches, that I thought, yeah, I think it's so important and it's, there's so so my, yeah, so yeah few information about this because there's a lot of sites talking about method methodology, training sessions. Uh, if you tra train train like this, you're like Guardiola, you're next Simeone, etc., which is very good. Um, but but then the same thing, yeah, it's it's not the most important thing, according to a lot of people uh, on high levels and low levels, and in my experience. So then I thought, there, this is a gap. Um, I, I I'm going to write a book, and then I um, I also got backed up in this by a couple of publishers in the Netherlands that said. This is really a niche, so uh, and then we, we we went for it and uh, yeah, so far there's a lot of uh, positive uh, feedback on it. So that's that's great that that coaches, uh, you know, they send me messages on Twitter and and LinkedIn or sometimes via email, saying uh, what they've learned or what they picked from it. And uh, also on uh, when when we're in the sessions with the clubs, the one thing that stands out that comes back every time that whether whenever we do a session is that coaches say i never knew about the role of autonomy so giving autonomy to players giving them choices instead of telling them to do everything and everything and uh, i think that's that's wonderful because yeah autonomy the need for autonomy it's it's one of the basic human needs and if we can fill in the fill in those needs in the right way then chances are you will get the best out of the people and it, it won't necessarily mean you're going to win matches but at least you, you get the most of uh, out of the people and that's i think yeah the, what yeah what yeah at least what drove me as a coach so uh the the other bit that i thought was interesting in in your introduction that links to this is and i love this point about autonomy and actually that took that was going to take me where we went to um so you, i heard you say a couple of things one of them was that obviously your own personal experience is within an academy as a as a young, I imagine, adolescent, or were you younger than that? Uh, no, I was I was twenty four when I started. Oh, okay, twenty four yeah. when you started. You mean as a coach or as a player? Oh, as a, as a coach, yeah. As a player, I was uh, around twelve, twelve, thirteen, around twelve. Yeah, and you, and I heard you talk about you know the pressure that you experienced, and so, and then I also heard you talk about the you know the desire to create a culture with a growth mindset. So I do wonder because oft often we're motivated by our own experiences. Mm -hmm. Is that is that a driver for you in terms of the environments that you have wanted to create as a coach, which is the environment that you didn't get that you may have been able to thrive or do better within, rather than one which was extremely high pressure and one in which you found it very very difficult to perform within mm -hmm. yeah that's that's a big driver i um I, I i have to say i have to be honest that i think the the person who you know put the most pressure on me was myself so sure. i i i um i didn't have the tools etc to to deal with this because yeah i think every player has in, in what level and what environment you you're going to create there's going to be pressure because yeah this uh it's it's your dream. Uh, it's important that for you to develop, etc. Uh, yeah, but uh, what is a big drive for me is is to yeah to create the culture in which the chances are highest that every player in that culture is going to get the most out of themselves. And um, for me, it was it's, it was sometimes quite difficult to to accept that I I didn't get the most out of myself because yeah I, f I felt yeah like I said I felt quite a lot of pressure and um uh like you said <laughs> it's sometimes also research is me search so um that's true that's true with case as well um but i think it's it's yeah it's one of my driving uh, points to to yeah how do you say that to help other athletes by inspiring coaches etc to f have a feeling that whatever their dream is if they don't make it that they can look into the mirror and say well, at least I did everything I had in my control um, for it, and I got everything out of it. Didn't work out, but I'm, I'm, it's fine with me. And I, I had a bit of a struggle to accept this because I felt I didn't took everything out of it. So, 
yeah now it, you touched on something there that i think is really important when you used to reference this this the word tools so uh that there has been research conducted in the past um that talks about how difficult and traumatic experiences are important to athlete development again there's some there's some big question marks about this personally but any or not personally there are some question marks about this but there is an association with traumatic childhood experiences and super elite athletes not 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 a correlation but an association mm -hmm. and um the assumption being and the, the famous the famous article written about this or paper written about this was this the title talent needs trauma which i don't agree with but um the Th this notion was this idea that actually these are formative experiences that people learn from and then they develop the tools as a result. Now, that only works for those that respond in that way. And mm. they have to have a supportive environment around them in order. And, th and this was found in the research, by the way, that there happened to be uh, also that where those individuals had these traumatic experiences, they also had support around them to be able to respond to those traumatic experiences. The re and the traumatic experiences weren't always mm -hmm. board related. They're sometimes outside. But anyway, idea the support is there. Now, and you've talked about tools. So I've sort of often spoken about this particular research, and I'm quite critical of it. And I talk about the fact that I don't think talent needs trauma. Talent needs tools. And I've had several individuals on the podcast in the past people like mustafa Sarka and jamie edwards who work with young athletes in academies or they talk about you know the kind of challenge point theory so to speak and creating the right environments you know so you want the right amount of challenge and the right amount of support and you want to create that kind of environment and jamie edwards when he was on the podcast talked about this notion of he said that we often send young people into these talent pathways you know at quite formative ages like you know in your case you know 11 12 um where but we do so without necessarily an in, uh, 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 an environment where the staff in the environment don't really understand the kinds of tools that they need to provide to young people in order to help them thrive and likewise the young people themselves don't have the tools and there's no one to help give them those tools. So mm -hmm. the uh, he describes it as it's like you're asking young people to climb Everest wearing like a light raincoat. There's, they're just not equipped for the journey. Yeah. And I think that that's, if there's a kind of a big theme within this show, it's this idea that we as coaches and practitioners need to become much more well-versed in these elements these sort of psychological emotional mental de developmental elements in order to provide this kind of environment for young people but not just an environment provide the young people with the kinds of tools they need to operate within your environment and any environment that they might next go on to mm -hmm. and so you talked about the growth mindset and i think this is the power of the, uh, the construct around the growth mindset which is it's centered around this notion of providing young people with an environment where those tools will be developed mm -hmm. so it's not necessarily they have to be taught as such sometimes they do but it's more around the environment drawing these resources out of young people by being intentional in design sorry i've gone off on a huge rant but i'd just be interested <laughs> yeah. to get your reflections on that <laughs> yeah i think you make you're making a great point because um uh as with a lot of things in, in, in life, and I don't want to be too philosophical, but it's whenever we find something, we, we tend to go all the way and then sometimes a bit too far too far out, I think. Uh, because I, I do think there's some, um, some point in having people learn how to deal with setbacks, struggles, etc. Sure, sure. Um, because you, you're, going to, you're going to be confronted by them. And then it's very important that you know how you could do this. And... Um, so I so I think what what you're saying I I don't think it has to be so big with it with that we need trauma I think in order to deal with trauma you, it's yeah you have to have experienced very very small bits so that you gradually could uh, learn how to deal with them deal with the setbacks deal with the mistakes deal with you know whatever 
and then you're able to if if there's going to be trauma then then you're you're um you, you know you you're uh, you're capable of dealing with it now i, I didn't i didn't experience the, it, it as trauma by the way but for me it was yeah it was too, a bit uh, too 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 difficult at that moment um and what we try to do is uh, i remember one game when we uh, we we played away we played in the in the dutch league uh, the highest level and we we played a very 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 good game with the the boys uh, it's the way we trained the way we wanted to play we were giving it all we we had more chances than the opposition but they they were better in finishing so they scored more goals and then the boys they were very disappointed and they were going into this mode like yeah we will never win and we gave everything and they're bigger and they're faster blah 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 blah, blah. and those are moments i think are very key for for a coach to to you know help them see see the picture and how to to um to deal with those moments so um i think there's a lot of ways you could do this the way i i i did was i told them well first off it starts with giving everything you've got did you do this yes you've done this so then that that's the starting point and the most important point because that's what you control fully uh then if you do this then odds are bigger that you're going to develop yourself so that you're able to perform to the highest level that you are capable of and then that will bring higher chances to winning the game but it's not a if you give everything that you will directly win there's there's going to be opposition they want to win as well they have good players as well etc cetera, etc cetera. so those kind of i don't i don't know how how you could say this but um cause and effect relationships to to get them across to the players to help them deal with this but also there's some great work now from david jaeger from the uh, i don't know exactly what university he's from but he's also doing work on the growth mindset but also he's coupling it with another mindset about stress and how you perceive stress is very important in how you deal with it so if you think stress is bad then you want to avoid it then you know a lot of things happen probably not in your best interest but if you see stress as something like oh i'm stretching myself i'm 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 here out here just getting ready for the for the for the game etc then a lot of uh, things will be probably in, in your best interest so i think those kind of things but also what's very important what i found to be very important as well is that my boss bastian he was the head of academy and he told me Maro, I'm going to evaluate you not on the amount of matches you win, but on the amount of progress your players make in your team. And if someone is putting the the aim like this, and very, very uh, explicit on this, um, on the development of the players, well, that's that that's big. That's that helps so many coaches because a lot of coaches that I I I I honestly think um, most of them want to work in this way. But uh, I also know stories from head of academies that also say, well, for us, it's all about developing the players. Uh, and by the way, it's it's up to everyone eh, to, to, to decide where they focus on. But be honest and clear about this with the players and their parents. But sometimes there will be head of academies that would, that would say the same, well, we're all about developing. But then come Monday... And all the youth in youth teams won in the weekend. That would be cake for every youth coach. Yeah, what is the signal you're you're signaling to everyone? <laughs> yeah, those things do really happen. That's that's so great though that you had somebody like that because there's a symbiotic relationship between the coach form of life and then the athlete experience. People miss this; mm -hmm. they just assume that. Because you say to a coach that you've got to do this is what I'm going to do or whatever, or you you um, provide so like for example the cake example is a good one rewards right so if you say it's about development but then the coaches that win most get promoted or get the next job and this that and the other then you're sending in the wrong signals yep. so to have somebody who is going to be as committed to that and say actually this is about development and all those sorts of things very few people do that yep interestingly though your point about um, this is why I like about the growth mindset stuff, because you're right. It's not about like, I think it's as dangerous to create a smooth journey as it mm -hmm. is to, as it is to create something that's overly taxing. Yeah. You know, those, those two extremes are too, too much. So it just made me think actually, and I've just coined the phrase, which is instead of talent needs trauma, maybe we should say talent needs turbulence. 
So you yeah. have to be intentional about this. And this is one of the things that Carol Dweck, I'll never forget it, when I was fortunate enough to meet her at a conference that I organized once where she said, I've said this before on the show, which is, uh, she says, nobody comes home from work and says, honey, I've had the most amazing struggle today. <laughs> But what I love about the growth mindset is it's not about making things easy. If, if anything, it's making things challenging. But it's actually uh, engendering in young people the idea that challenge, difficulty and failure are something to be um, looked for, not avoided. Yep. And I think the danger is often, and I, I know I was guilty of this and have been guilty of this, is I, we create environments for young people which, where we remove all obstacles in order to make it as easy as we possibly can. And in actual fact, I think we ought to be more intentional in creating the right level of destabilization mm -hmm. in order for those individuals to be able to then not only grow, but also learn from those experiences and help to foster that kind of environment around personal improvement. Yep, exactly. I think so too. So I, I, I do like the phrase, talent needs uh, turbulence. And yeah, it's it's in those little things as well. It's like uh, w when we were playing a game, it's it's all where you focus yourself on. And I think it's very uh, it's very helpful if a head of, head of academy is so explicit on what he's going to evaluate you on, and it's on the progress of the players instead of winning the matches, etc. Um, but for us coaches as well, if if someone is playing um, in in the game and he he or she uses the the weaker foot, then what do we react to this? If we are going to say uh, we want to develop, then we yeah we give uh, constructive feedback. Okay, great that you try it with your left foot or your right foot, whatever the weaker foot is. Um, next time, blah, 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 blah. But if we're all intentional about winning, and if that's what's most important, then you say, don't do that again. Use your best foot. Because then odds are that the, in the moment, in the, on the short term, there will be success. And uh, a lot of times... We are also discussing the role of winning in youth academies when we go out to clubs. And um, then these things come up like, okay, in those small moments. So that's also the culture, I think, because in those small moments, then you, you signal to players what you're all about. And you, everybody, when they're calm, when they're, when they're rational, they will say more or less the same things. But I think it's up to what you're doing in the moments uh, where the things happen that decide Okay, what, 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 what are you all about? So when someone is making a mistake, when someone, but also the other side, like you said, when, when someone is doing everything correctly, they're, 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 they're week in, week out, they're the best player on the pitch. Then in my head, some bells are going to ring. Um, and that's also funny because sometimes uh, coaches would come up to me and they would tell me, you're kind of funny. And then I would ask them, how do you mean? And then they would say, you just send your best players every Saturday to the, to the higher teams. And I said, yeah, isn't that what it's about? I want them to develop. I want them to 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 stretch themselves. So if if I could also have a player in my team um, and then everything goes smoothly for this player, he would help us win probably, or the, he, at least he would raise the chances. But I don't think that's the most important thing in in, in the youth academy. So I would I would always be very happy if, if coaches would come up to me. And sometimes that meant I would send up four players. Yeah. But it, 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 would make, it, it would make me so proud if I would go to see the matches and then talk to the coaches afterwards. And then they, they would say, well, the, the, uh, it, it happens sometimes that I would say one of your players was the best on the pitch today. That would make me so proud because then they're stretching their levels. And then because that's the most important thing, we can give them feedback. But the best feedback they can get is the, the, yeah, the most authentic feedback is the way they play in the game. And if they feel I can play in a, a team in a higher age group and I, I can be performing at my highest level even at the best yet yeah, I don't think any feedback from me could could top this and I, I wouldn't I would never want to top it because that's what it's all about yeah yeah you remind me actually about why one of the reasons why Dweck is so against the idea of praise because it can be such a dangerous thing praise because sometimes it shows what we what we value and if you praise performance which is very easy to do and you can get very easily sucked into praising performance then you're sending out the subtle message that it's the mm. outcome that's important not the process of yep. and the struggle so i have to remind myself along a lot you know about actually um recognizing though you know recognizing the moments of failure that are 
have value you know like when somebody's mm -hmm. trying something out and drawing that out to say look what they tried to do didn't work out but look what they tried to do that's yeah. great we like that right and i think that's a really important part about going back to your point about establishing the culture particularly for young people what we don't want them to do is to get drawn into a mentality that i need to be able to deliver outcomes for coaches in order to receive praise and potential selection and i'm going to talk about selection because you've got a great section in the book about selection um and i think that's a really important thing to get get across is that actually the va the value of a young person in this environment is for them to actually be what's there's a great video isn't it fail harder you know kids come along mm -hmm. look what i can do yeah fail harder <laughs> yeah yeah exactly but and that's on the one side but also on the other side if everything is going too easy for someone then he or she is not developing as well and then and but that's also funny because then sometimes uh, parents would come up to you and they, they would say ah oh, my boy couldn't he go go up uh, age level as well he's was well, one of the best but then there's five parents there and there's only 15 boys in the team so that makes one third of the team the best yeah that's that, that's also funny so um what, what yeah we what we try to do every time is to just to look for okay who's who would you, who do we think needs to be stretched in the upcoming match uh, and that person would go up with the the higher team and then what you also say about the the praise because again those are the small moments uh, in which th yeah, you can signal about the culture that you're in um what we almost always try to do was what I what I mentioned before in, in the example with the players, with the um, giving all the effort that you have, that will uh, raise chances of performing and develop developing, and that will raise chances of winning. So what we try to do in every match was um, we, we 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 would focus on certain, uh, I think you could call them either process or performance goals. So we would keep track of them. How many times we got in the in the in the box of the opposition? How many times we could find uh, someone in midfield free on the ball with his face to the towards uh, the the goal of the uh, the opponent, and we would keep score of this, so that every time whenever we would be we we would be either down or we would be winning, we could always look back on the process and we could say, hey, but we're we're having trouble. We're we're, we're I don't know. We're up one nil, but we're having trouble finding the the, the 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 free men on the midfield. What should we do? How can we do this? And we would always try to make them think about this, so about the process, and have them see how it links to, because in the end, the players do want to win, and that's that's perfectly fine with me, but I have to be there to help them, you know, see how, how they could raise those chances, but also how they could raise their chance of becoming a professional football player. And there's only one going to be, uh, you know, promoted. It's not entire teams who go up. So I would always elaborate with them uh, what my reasons were to to promote some people to a team, uh, a higher age group. But we, what we would also do is to put players down in age group because physically they weren't ready for the, you know, the, the, the turbulence in the in their own age group. And that was kind of a hassle, at, at least in the beginning. But we, yeah, we we explained it to the boys, we explained it to the parents, and the boys quite quickly grasped it and accepted it. But the parents sometimes had their troubles and their doubt, their, their doubts. But I think also that signals to them yeah, what what it's all about for us. So you, you've took you just touched on this, and I wanted to just draw it, draw your draw, draw like ask you about it really. Is you you mentioned earlier on this idea around getting rid of the relative age effect by not having young people in their birth year necessarily more basing it around their probably i imagine their stage of development and maybe about their physical development psychological maturation and all these these factors and um in the book actually you know you actually have a section on selection and you know getting selection right and not necessarily selecting the best the so-called best mm -hmm. but actually being more intentional about selection to create the right level of developmental experience and you know so sometimes it might be that this player goes to another team because they need the stretch this week sometimes it might be something else so it sounds to me like that's how you were approaching this you were creating an environment where you got rid of these artificial notions of age and you put people into teams 
sometimes it's about giving them an easier ride, isn't it? Sometimes you want them to have mm-hmm. a, a bit of bit of confidence by playing at a level that's sort of slightly below them where they can do more things and be more expressive. And then sometimes you want them to get some stretch where yep. those things are going to be more difficult. Yeah, exactly. Because sometimes what we saw uh, on team level, but also on individual level, is that whenever there's too much turbulence during the game, uh, then you're not in. You're not going into learning mode. You're just in surviving mode, and yes. then uh, yeah, players don't learn as much as they could or that we wanted to. So to us, uh, that was also kind of uh, different from the other clubs. What we were doing is we wouldn't care less about the competition or the level we were playing because we thought we will be playing in a level that suits the level of our players best. And then with the extreme side, so the, the 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 really best players and the players who have a lot of difficulty on this level, we have to come up with solutions for them to keep them developing as well. So for the the players on the one end, it's going up. The players on the other end is going it's going uh, an age group down, because then they would they would be able to develop their qualities because every player has his or her qualities, and it's up to us to make sure that they get a challenge that matches more or less their quality so that they can make the next step um kind of a sidestep uh is that Jurgen Klopp was asked when he became coach of Liverpool he was asked uh, how can you deal with the pressure of Liverpool because the pressure here is quite big isn't it and he said yes the pressure here is quite big but he said I came from Mainz uh, I became manager there and the, the pressure it's 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 there but it's not too much so I could learn to deal with that amount of pressure then I became coach of uh, Borussia Dortmund and the level of uh, pressure is higher there, but then I could learn this as well. And now with Liverpool, the pressure is again a bit higher, but yeah, I've managed to do it before. Yeah. So so then he said at Liverpool, um, the pressure is higher than at, at Dortmund, but because the step now is is for me to to do because i had the, the previous steps taken it's durable for me and it's the same for our, our youth players whenever they're going to develop if the steps are too big and sometimes you see this uh, with the relative age effect that the the boys same age playing each other but one is one i don't know one time uh, taller than the other one yeah that's not really a fair context and a fair how do you say challenge for both of them so so for both the the, the 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 player who's who's taller and for the player who's smaller, it's not the, the best uh, challenge for them. So yeah, we would we would try as hard as we could to to make sure they would be challenged right, because then also they would have the most uh, chances of feeling competent in what they're doing. Because whatever uh, the players are going to do, we we thought that's very Im- important for them to feel that they are able to do the things that they feel competent. So. That's also a very important uh, thing for us uh, as well. And yeah, again, what what we looked for in, in the player was um, that they had a well-being, so they were they were feeling well, and they were involved, so they were motivated to come to train, to play, etc. And those things we would focus on. If there if there would be something wrong with these, we would go into in, in, into talking with them, with the parents, etc., to see what was going on, um, because we believed. Whenever the well-being and the involvement is is all right, then the rest will follow naturally, and it's up to us to create the situations for them, uh, yeah, that they could develop themselves in those uh, in those ways. So, um, I think that's that's very important as well for for talent selection. That if you want the players, because sometimes uh, we 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 think of the. Mm, in the end, if, if you want to be a professional football player, you have to, you have to reach a certain level because otherwise, yeah, you, you can't you can't participate. But at the youth age, you're not already there because otherwise, you would already be in the first team. So you have to develop yourself to that level. And I think it's up to us to make sure that chances are that yeah that everybody reaches their own top, and then we can see at the adult level if that's enough for you, yes or no, or if you need. Uh, a couple of years more if it's not the case that it's going to happen for you but if we're going to yeah you know pick the 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 tallest players and we we use uh yeah we give them the playing time etc then yeah 
then sometimes we're we're not looking really for the for the yeah I I don't know for the the level that you need in the end because at the moment they can win the games for you they 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 will um, they will be stronger in duels so they it, to them it doesn't matter if if the the ball is not completely handled in the the perfect way because they can use the body but when you're small and you have to play against bigger uh, children you need to have the, the yeah maybe not the perfect handling of the ball but quite quite well handling of the ball because otherwise you you're losing the ball and um i think that we we try to to look for those players who were very involved in the game who wanted to learn and then we would pick them and uh so what we would do is um we would ask all the players so that's also funny what we did is um normally uh, professional teams at least in the in the in the netherlands they have scouts you know they wander around all the the clubs in the neighborhood looking for talent and we minimized the amount of scouts uh one is because we were only focusing on tilburg and the the the, the cities around the tilburg or the villages nearby um and we would organize talent days so we would organize days for for boys uh, and also girls born in a certain year so for example 2006 and if you want to you know to to show us what you've got you like football uh, etc then you can come so we organized those talent days and then we had uh, we asked the players and probably the parents sometimes because yeah for the players it's sometimes maybe not <laughs> It's difficult to to fill in all the forms, but we ask for the height, for the um, how much uh, kilograms they would weigh, a lot of those things, and then we, in in the formula we had, we would match this everything, also the amount of years they would they had been playing football, because if you have a player who's been playing one year and a player who's playing for four years, it's there's going to be a difference, but yeah, what's the difference about? Because the the player for four years, you know, he, he has more experience, so probably he is better than the, the one of one uh, year playing experience. So that we could would be in the mix, and then, you know, the 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 boys would be playing and and the girls as well because it was girls sometimes as well. But yeah, the boys could come into the academy. So for the girls, it was only an experience. But then we had the boys, roughly with the more or less the same backgrounds, playing with each other on certain fields, and then. Everybody, because that's very difficult. If you go to look for talent, everybody's going to, uh, you know, um, uh, look and compare players with each other. So if you then can create this, the, or at least try to optimize for situations that players are better able to compare with each other, then yeah, we found then the, the the relative age effect would go would disappear. Oh, it's fascinating. I do, I do, I do sometimes wonder why, you know, so many organisations persevere with, you know, the, the arbitrary cut-off point of a calendar date, uh, even though we know how limiting it is. Um, the other thing I wanted to just pull pull on as well, um, just as we sort of come have to draw this to a close, um, mm-hmm. is you talk about winning. Um, but by the way, I think the book is much more than. I mean, I described it earlier on as, you know, you're looking at the software side. I think it's more of a like a, a talent manual because it talks a lot about the ways in which you would best develop talent. Yes, focused on the develop, developing the kind of psychological, mental, emotional qualities in individuals to help them navigate a talent environment. But fundamentally, it, it, it's like it speaks to one half of the talent equation. So talent equation is... The reason the salad equation was even created was the idea of trying to balance off the fact that, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at the, you know, the, the kind of the, the very visible physical qualities, technical, tactical, physical, et cetera, et cetera. But we spend much less time exploring, you know, the, what you might call the less visible qualities, such as, mm-hmm. you know, motivation, drive, determination, commitment, dedication, all of which are developable to a lesser or greater extent. And, um, and we make assessment decisions not based on that. And yet, what we, whenever again you look at athlete biographies, and what you always see, or nearly always see, and again this is retrospective, is generally speaking that the gen, you know, that the athletes that are, dri- are dri- uh, that, that are the most driven, the most committed, the most dedicated, willing to kind of work their way through struggle and challenge, and actually embrace struggle and challenge, and all those sorts of things, are the ones that actually genuinely make it, even if they're not necessarily the most athletic or most so-called gifted specimens at an early stage. 
So that's what I love about this book. You're speaking to that side, which I love, mm. right? It's the other side of the equation, the other 50%. If it's not more, it's more than 50%. If you talk about winning, and I think winning is really important from a culture perspective, you've got a lovely little passage from Johan Cruyff about um, the idea that the only team in a club that should be worried about winning is the first team because every other club, every other team is some, in somehow linked to, linked to development. And that actually, if you're focused on winning, you are actively working against development. I've said this before, that competition can be absolutely cancerous towards athletic development, mm -hmm. particularly because um, it fosters this different outlook. And so whenever I see coaches out there on social media sort of lauding their uh, record, I just want to say that makes you a bad talent coach. You're a bad, you know, well done. You've just earmarked yourself to be a bad development, a bad developer of talent by actually putting out there what your record is. But anyway, I never do that, but I sometimes want to. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, um, I, I, yeah, it's, it's always a case of um, what, what are they doing behind the scenes? So maybe, um, how do you say, um, they're, 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 they're doing great job within uh, or behind the scenes, but then they also do this. So, uh, um, but, but I think, yeah, the, the role of winning, it's, it's so important. We can learn so many things for, from what we see. So what we see as football is most probably the Premier League, the Premier Division, so top class, top flight football. And there's lessons to be taken from there, but not everything can be taken and copied and pasted into youth academies. So up there, it's very, it's, it's, it's interesting because, um, Again, in the podcast, Alex Pastor, he's, he's, the, he's the, the, the podcast host. It's a Dutch post podcast. And he, Pastor, he has years of experience as a professional soccer coach, a football coach. And he gets the big names. So Arne Stott, for example, who is now going to Liverpool, has been on the show. Ronald Koeman, uh, the, the, our Dutch uh, national team coach. And he asked all the coaches, how important is winning, winning for you? So do, would you rather win in an ugly way or would you rather lose in a fantastic way? And then all they... All the coaches say, I would rather win in an ugly way. But then they are able to come back to this. And then uh, Pastor asked them the question later on in the show. So whenever would you feel this, the season would be a success to you? And then it's, it's so interesting because then every coach, uh, at least in the episodes that I've listened to, then they go and say, whenever we uh, performed at our maximum level. And then as pastor sometimes ask them the question, and even if that means that you don't reach the goals that you wanted, so that you got promoted, you didn't, you didn't relegate, you got uh, European football, etc. And then they say, even then, because yeah, we want to perform maximally, and if that's what we've done, what more can we ask for? So even if you're all about winning, so on the highest level, they are, because yeah, if you lose three times, then there's going to be trouble because of the press, etc. So and I can understand results being very important there. But even there, they say, if, if you ask them, it's all about performing at the maximum level. And I think that's worth a lesson to, to use and to bring back into youth academies and not so much the, the winning side. And that players want to win, fantastic. But I think our job as coaches is to prepare them, to learn them, how they can develop themselves, how they could even learn to win if they become older. So, for example, in uh, under-21 squads, etc. But yeah... Like Johan Cruyff and, and Wim Jong uh, say, only the first team has to care about winning, and the rest has to care about developing the players to get to the highest level. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Hey, listen, um, I wish we could talk for longer, and it may well be that we come back and explore some of the other chapters in a in a follow up uh, session. Um, but I know that a lot of people will be interested. So the coach makes the difference. Develop your vision on leadership, talent, motivation, and selection. Um, I know we've talked a lot about football, but I know you've written this very much for all sports coaches. It even says that on the on the cover. Um, available through Amazon, I'm assuming. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yes. And um, what what about if people want to get in touch and um, find out more, or you know maybe want to work with you, or kind of pick your brains, or whatever it is? What's the best way for them to uh, to reach out? That would also that I would love that if that would happen. Um, they could go to the coachmakesdifference.com. Uh, that I can learn more about the book, etc. Uh, I have a LinkedIn, uh, so yeah, my my name on LinkedIn, then then you will find me. But also, I have the coach makes a difference on LinkedIn. That might be a bit easier, because <laughs> given my name. 
Um, and then, yeah, they can find out. And I, I'm always open to talk, have a chat, exchange ideas, etc. So, uh, and thank you as well for for your time and for your interest in in the book and in, in talking about these topics. And whenever we can find the time, maybe next year after certain cancellations again, then <laughs> <laughs> I will I will remain uh, patient. Yeah, no, I'm trying to get better at that. I'm trying to get better than that. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I mean we haven't done it justice uh, in the time we've had available. But but I I think what we've done is we've delved into a couple of the kind of key areas. And like I said before, you know, it's a manifesto for talent development. And um, I think there are, there's a lot, what I love about it actually, by the way, is it's not, it's, you know, it's not just kind of a, you know, kind of a textbook, so to speak. It's actually got some really nice personal stories in there. You're, you're pulling from different sources, you're pulling from different coaches and their experiences. And it, it creates a really nice picture around what is quite often a challenging subject. And we definitely need to, get into that in a little bit more detail so anyway um i'm sorry i've got to run off but um really appreciate you coming on to chat to me and um i look forward to part two in fact i'm going to promise part two um in uh in a you know a couple of months time great yeah thank you for your time and uh, it was it was fun to be here i hope everybody could understand because my english is not, not that good but uh um, your English is excellent, actually, and it's a hell of a lot better than my Dutch. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're, I appreciate you coming on, Mara. Thank you. Thank